Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria, and everyone went to his own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house and line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to her firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them in the inn. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were afraid. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find the baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angels, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on on whom his favor rests. This is the good news of our Lord Jesus Christ. Please be seated. All right, it's kind of cool to do this. I want to try this. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. Oh, I think we can do a little bit better than that. It's Christmas time. Let's try one more time. Merry Christmas, everyone. Merry Christmas. All right, praise God. All right, 2,024 years ago, uh, roughly toward the end of 6 BC, if you or I could have looked up into the heavens, any, uh, anyone into night gazing here? All right, got a couple of hands here. Uh, we would have seen God filling the skies with unmistakable sign of the good news of great joy for all people. Today, I want to discuss two of these signs and how they reveal that Jesus is God's good news of a great joy for you and for me and for the whole world. But before we do this, uh, let's, uh, let's turn to prayer and ask God to fill us with acceptance in our hearts uh, that it may overflow with joy. Let us pray. God, we thank you for this opportunity to come to you this day and to open your word. Lord, uh, as we celebrate your birthday, Lord Jesus, remind us, Lord, it really is all about you, that all the signs in the heavens and uh, here with us on earth, they're all about you. And now allow us to receive your word, and we pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. We have a tendency nowadays, and I, I don't know if you're like me, but we have a tendency nowadays to think that people in Jesus' days were a lot more accepting, you know. Uh, They're simple, Um, they had this mental bias toward seeing God and miracles. And anyone think like that? Okay, you know it's a setup, right? So if you fully say, uh-huh, that's me, you know. Um, uh, But let's give it a shot. Anyone think like that? Uh, Never, okay. (laughs) You're too smart. Um, But the reality is exactly the opposite. As Tim Keller writes in his hidden book, uh, Hidden Christmas book, um, in fact, the people in Mary's stage 2,000 years ago had the opposite bias, right? Had the opposite bias. And I'm going to quote Keller, and, you know, it's sort of a Christian joke. And we know that no Christian sermon nowadays is complete without a Keller, you know, quote. But uh, uh, this is what Tim Keller writes. He, sa- he writes, you and I uh, have been trained by our culture to not believe in the supernatural, Okay? Everywhere we go, you know, don't, don't believe in the supernatural. But the reality was, as a Jewish woman 2,000 years ago, Mary had been trained by her culture to not believe that God could ever become a human being. Okay? So different biases or different issues, but the same bias. So though they are different, the barriers that Mary faced against belief in the Christmas message were every bit as big as the ones that we face today. And the barriers that we're facing today, it may be different, but it, it's just as big as Mary. And yet a combination of evidence and experience shattered those barriers, and Mary came to faith. And that is exactly the way it works today and now. She doubted, she questioned, she used her reason, and she asked questions, just as we do today 
if we're ever going to have faith. That's, so I want to just start by saying that, yeah, uh, um, we have our own biases today. But guess what? 2,000 years ago, it wasn't as if people automatically accepted, oh, this is happening. This brings us to the question. So what are the two signs that God showed that I'm going to talk about today? There's more. But what are the two signs of the good news of the great joy that filled the skies in 6 B.C.? The first one I want to talk about is this. The story, uh, the first sign is that God uses the display of stars. God uses the display of stars. The story of the birth of Jesus happened in a very straightforward manner. By the way, if you have your books, a Bible, uh, please turn to Luke chapter uh, 2. Uh, it's just following along what we read. And, and it says, In those days Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And everyone went to his own home, to his own town to register. So we just read about how Joseph went up also from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, to the town of David. That's the royal town, right? Because he, David, belonged to the house and the line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him and expecting a child. And while they were there, the time, time came for the baby to be born. That's the story of Jesus. That's very straightforward. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she uh, wrapped him in cloths and placed him in a manger because there was no room for them at the inn. But surrounding this birth story, there's more. For God, at that point, filled the skies with two clear signs. And the first was a display of the stars. And this is a story that's actually not found in Luke. Matthew talks about it. But this is predominantly found in Matthew. And the heavenly display in Matthew is where we start today. So uh, Matthew chapter uh, um, 2 talks about how the Magi from the east came from Jerusalem, came to Jerusalem and asked, where is the one born of the king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east and have come to worship him. All right. So that's what I'm going to talk about. And I'm going to get a little more into detail. But before I do, again, I want to set the stage here. God's not using astrology. Astrology is not what he does. But what he does is he often, and this is something that he did 2,000 years ago, this is something that he's doing today. He will take the references that we know, because God is, you know, he's God. He knows everything. We're the ones with the limitation. But what God does is he takes the reference, and today our primary reference is probably science, you know. But he takes whatever reference we have, and he communicates to that reference. And 2,000 years ago, the way that people saw the world, the way that they visualized everything was vastly different from today. They would look up and they would see the stars. They would recognize what quadrant of the sky that was. You know, they would understand what constellation. Uh, interesting thing. Uh, the, sa- the word that, the, uh, um, the, in essence, the, the Greeks used uh, for constellation was actually the same word for signs. So that's the way the people thought. So when they saw the sky and they saw a constellation, they saw it as a sign. And so that's the language that God is using. By the way, later on, I'm going to talk about and challenge us. What is the, you know, how is God speaking to us in our language? But so that's the context here, right? And the heavenly display in Matthew is where we start. So uh, um, this is how God uses what we saw. And one of the most intriguing theory, so there's a theory about this, is uh, the star Bethlehem. And for a lot of times, um, how many people have seen these movies where there's all these theories about what the star of Bethlehem is? They thought it's Jupiter, and they saw Venus, and one other star. And there's, there's been several movies in the last five, six years about how maybe that's the star of Bethlehem. Um, but there's this, there's this new idea that came out. And it's not a new idea, but it's, it's something that someone finally put some meat to. is that uh, they think the star of Bethlehem was not a series of planets. They actually thought, they think, looking at the biblical evidence piecing it back together. Again, we don't have all the records of comets, but they think it's a comet. Um, There are two main sources of comet information from antiquities. One of them is Chinese, the other one is Roman. But they were not, uh, they didn't capture everything. They think maybe about 35 to 40% of all the comets that were in the sky were captured, including the big ones. So we don't have a specific record of this particular comet, but that's not unusual and that's not, uh, uh, that's not all that unexpected. But one of the theories that's been out recently is that what God used was, in essence, he used uh, a comet. And so what the Magi speak about in, uh, uh, in, in, in Matthew to Herod is, in essence, they've been tracking a comet. And this is the theory of, uh, this is from a book called The Great Com- Christ Comet uh, in 2015 by Colin Nichols. 
And his case is that the star of Bethlehem was a, and this is a de- definition that I'm going to, have to read out to you. It was, how many people into, again, anyone into looking at stars and something? All right, maybe you know this. It's a narrowly inclined, retrograde, long period comet. All right, I'm going to say this again. A narrowly inclined, retrograde, long period comet. I'm going to skip uh, the technical stuff, but this is the way that 2,000 years ago people would have seen the stars. Okay? First of all, uh, the comet, where it appeared was in the constellation of Virgo. Already very meaningful, right? But 2,000 years ago, this is the way people saw it. And what, would, what they would have seen is that there would have been, in essence, the beginning of a dot, right? So this is the, Vir- this is the constellation Virgo as it would have appeared over Israel in 6 BC because the stars, because you know, things have moved. This is the way they would have seen it. And suddenly what would have happened was that a comet would have appeared. And by suddenly, I don't mean like uh, uh, you know, over, overnight. I mean, it, it would have happened over the course of some time. But what would happen is that a comet would appear exactly where the people would have imagined the, the stomach of, the, of Virgo, which means the virgin. Okay? By the way, um, this, this is a pretty, pretty cool theory. This, by the way, is the way we understand or the theory goes on that this is actually something that uh, Revelation chapter 12 talks about later on. So now the people are walking and, and they look up in the sky, night sky. What do they see? They see in the constellation Virgo this, this large dot. And it, it grows and grows. And then it starts to move down. Kind of cool, huh? Now, what's really happening is uh, it, it, in the, the, the evidence seems pretty good. As the comet is going around the sun, um, it, it's, it starts to, in essence, appear different to us. And so what we're seeing is the, the change in the comet's trajectory from Earth perspective. But you got to think about this. You're 2,000 years ago. You look up, you see in the constellation Virgo, this dot appear. And then this dot starts to drop. This is what the Magi's were looking at. Okay. And, and what would happen is that it would grow in size, become elliptical. And then as the, the comet seems to drop from the virgin, one last thing was happening. There would have been a, an asteroid shower that happened. And so if you think about it from 2,000 years ago, their perspective is, wait a minute. What is going on around here? And this is not over. The cool thing is, the last thing that would have happened with this comet would have been that the comet would then pass the Earth, then change shape, and now look like it's a scepter pointing straight down at one particular house. Any guess as to which house it might have been? This is what the Magi's probably saw. This fits the description, the physical description, of that kind of comet that I mentioned before. And, and the, so the theory is that when you look at the biblical evidence, again, we don't have this particular comet, but like I said, we didn't capture all the comets. But to the people living 2,000 years ago, especially to the Magi's who are trained to look for signs, God's not using astrology. He's using the common language of the people, the way that people imagine the world. And again, God uses all of our senses, and, and he did 2,000 years ago, the way that people would have seen, the way that they would have spoken, the way that their minds would have worked. And, and the truth would have been God telling us, I am doing something big. I'm doing something big. Use your observation. Follow. And indeed, this is exactly what the Magi do. They don't believe in God, but even they can't help but see, you know, this God that the Jews, the Hebrews spoke of, you know, He's doing it. He, he's, he's doing it again. He's really doing something in the skies. And even though they didn't know God, they observed and they began to follow. And they, 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 it was all what they knew about. And yet God began to move even everything that they knew to say, I'm doing something big. And this is what prompted them to undertake a 550-mile journey. How many people like to travel 550 miles during Christmas time? You know, these guys traveled 550 miles to get to 
Jerusalem from where they were. That's kind of, why? Because they saw and, and they knew something was going on. So that's the first sign that God uses. God uses the display of heavens. Really, he's speaking to us using everything that we know and understand. Which brings us to the second and unmistakable sign that filled the skies 2,000 years ago. The second sign was that God uses angels, heavenly messengers. Um, This is in the book of Luke. This is what we read about today. Uh, The second unmistakable sign would have been angels. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Now, if you were here last Sunday, you know why they're terrified, right? Because the last time they saw an angel, you know, Jerusalem was being destroyed, right? The last time the angel Gabriel spoke, he was speaking about the the judgment over the world. So, again, this is their perspective. So that's why the, the, the shepherds were, were terrified. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid. I bring you good news of a great joy that will be for all people. Great, good news of a great joy that will be for all people. This is quite different, right? Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will be, you'll find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. So now we have, uh, uh, we have the, the comet. We have the, uh, the, the meteor shower. And now we have the angels in the sky praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. This, this, is, this is that story. So the second sign that God uses are angels, Right? Luke tells us that after Jesus' birth, the angels appeared. And, and the angels said, don't be afraid. I don't bring you bad news. I bring you great news. And that's, that's the reality that God again uses. Now, earlier I mentioned how we think that people 2,000 years ago, um, you know, this was not natural for them. Right? And somehow, uh, some of us are, I think sometimes we think it's easier for them to accept and, and I think we sort of use this not as an intellectual excuse, but as an emotional excuse. We say, you know, God can't be, you know, it, those people were simple. They didn't know what we know today. And instead of using it as an intellectual logic for understanding the way the world that God makes, we use it actually as an emotional escape for us to say, so I don't have to believe in God today. But that would be, I think, a mistake. Because I think the reality, the biblical record, is that God always speaks to us. And that's what happened 2,000 years ago. It had been 450 years since Ezra and Nehemiah. 425 years since Malachi, who was the last prophet that God spoke to. And now, in the town of Bethlehem, God sends his angels. And not just to shepherds. He sends them to Zechariah. He sends them to Mary. He sends them to Joseph. He sends them to the shepherds. And, and that's the reality. God speaks to the people. So let's recap for a second. Two signs. First of them has to do with what? Has to do with the, the skies filling with signs. And, and the second has to do with the angels coming to people. And what does that add up to? Well, the unmistakable conclusion is that God keeps his promise and that he came. He came to this earth. God came to this earth for you and for me. Christmas is all about the coming of Jesus. And it, it wasn't a surprise. It, it wasn't a, a shock, or it shouldn't have been. It wasn't, it wasn't like a, a, a trick that God literally lit up the skies and says, I'm coming. I've come for you. And that's the good news of Jesus Christ. With Jesus, we have every reason to celebrate that God is here with you and with me, with us. This is what Christmas is about. Um, in Jesus' time, from following Jesus, one of the interesting things that happens in the New Testament is that now when the angels appear, really, we don't have to be fearful anymore because now we're with Jesus. And, and, and the good news is that God has made us into a new people. 
And God is creating us into the people who later on, the Bible says, we're going to be judging angels. So we go from, you know, being afraid of angels to someday we're going to be judging angels. That's how God esteems us highly. He loves us and he cares for us. The good news of a great joy is that Jesus Christ, who is God, is with us. That's the news. Jesus Christ is God with us. Here today, here with you. This is the Christmas that we're here to celebrate. I want to end today with two simple questions, okay? So this, this is the two big signs that I want to talk about. But I want, to, I want to sort of go from there to ask some simple questions for all of us to ponder. First question is this. What are we doing with the evidence of Jesus in our lives today? What are we doing with the evidence that Jesus is, is Lord? What are we doing with the world? Like I said, one way to, to, to do this is to say, well, you know, it means nothing. That somehow the world sort of came, on, came, you know, came about on its own. But I think if we were to look around, the reality is that God is speaking to all of us. He may not be speaking in a, uh, in a loud voice sometimes, but every single one of us, he's speaking to all of us, and he's saying, I love you. No matter what you're going through, I love you. No matter who, what the situation is, I came for you. No matter what your sins are, I died for you. The, the message of Jesus Christ is, is the most amazing, profoundly positive and loving message. And he's using all of nature today to speak to us. So maybe he might not speak to us in, in, in the skies. Why? Because we don't think like that anymore. Right? How many of you are into, you know, you, you really think that science is a good way of looking at the world? I, I don't know about you. Any, anyone like science? Yeah, we all do. Right? I think God's speaking to us in science. We just have to look around and look at, this, look at the signs and look around and see how perfectly God has created this world. See how perfectly God has created you, right? So that's the first question. What are we doing with the evidence of Jesus in our lives that, in essence, uh, that second question, right, um, is will you listen to the angels in the life that Jesus is God with us, Right? Look around, look at the signs. But the second thing is, will you listen to the angels? Who are the angels, by the way? Who are the angels? Who do you think God is using as the angels nowadays? Oh, I heard the answer. Who is God using as angels today? Us. Right? This is the, this is the coolest thing. Now, God doesn't have to use angels anymore. Why? Why? Because God's chosen all of us, right? We don't have to wait for a terrifying visitation. Instead, we get to be the angels in the people's lives. That's the amazing good news of Jesus Christ, that God gave the sign that he's coming. He kept his word. He came as Jesus, died on the cross for us. He was then resurrected. And then he says, now have faith in me, and I'm choosing you to be my messengers, right? My ambassadors. We are the angels. We are the ones that Jesus is using to speak the positive message of love, of redemption, of reconciliation, and new life to this world. We are the angels. Now, maybe you're thinking, well, I don't feel like an angel today. Anyone feel like, it? you know, I'm, I don't feel like an angel today? Anyone think that maybe my kids are not angels? It's okay. It's okay. If you don't feel like an angel today, I'm fairly certain that you have someone in your life who is God's angel. And, and I think instead of saying, well, Christmas is about family, it's, it's about, you know, some, some strange values... If we can focus really on who, on who Christmas is really about, on Jesus, then it seems to me all of a sudden, a lot of things are going to make a lot more sense. So I want to end today with this question, who are the angels? 
And are you listening or will you listen to the angels in your lives? The ones that God is sending us. And, and the quiet question to the rest of us is, will we be an angel in someone else's life? Are we, are we willing to do that? I think that's what Christmas is truly about. It's about us recognizing that God has spoken to us, that Jesus Christ has come. And now it's our turn. Let's look around the world and let's celebrate the signs that God is here. And let's become an angel for one another. Amen? Merry Christmas. Amen. Let's all stand up together as we uh, close the service in worship. right it's not just the people on stage it's not just the band that are called to sing and called to worship it's all of us here that are to be the hands and feet of jesus and to be his choir especially this christmas season to tell everybody the great news about him so what we're going to do here is i'm going to sing for unto us a child is born and not the choir but the choir is going to respond with holy 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 does that sound good to you guys so let's try it out it goes like this for unto us a child is born you guys sing To us a child is born, we sing Holy, holy, holy Sounds amazing, let's keep doing that a little bit more For to us a child is born, we sing Holy, holy, holy We all lift up our voices For to us a child is born The child is born, we sing. Let's do this one more time together, everybody. For unto us the child is born, we sing. 